Welcome into our Sports First studios. For this Monday edition of Sports First, Gabriel Amada alongside Andres Cordero with his infamous handshake. We want to say hello to everyone watching us on Sports First and also to our new viewers watching us through our new Be an Extra channel. How exciting! That's pretty nice. It is, and we're going to do a full La Liga recap because La Liga was loca. We're also going to talk a little bit of transfers, talk some Serie A, and today's National Technology Day, Dre? Every day is National Technology Day. Exactly. Very true. Hashtag 2020. But Cristiano Ronaldo has a little bit of a technology throwback for us. All this on Sports First. That starts now. Sports First is presented by Bosch Icon High Performance Windshield Wipers. Want to kick off our show with our Bosch High Performance Player of the Weekend. Drum roll, please. It was Rafael Varane. The Frenchman was key to Real Madrid's 3 0 win over Getafe, scoring two goals. Well, technically, it was one because one of them was handed as an own goal, but he was key to Real Madrid's victory. Courtois also very key to this. And this begins our uh, full La Liga recap, Dre, yes. because what a weekend it was. Uh, so we've got uh, first and second level on 40 points, Barcelona and Real Madrid, separated by a goal difference of two. And then just behind them, Atleti actually climbing into third place because Sevilla slipped points, but third and fourth are also tied on points on 35. Both teams, uh, both, I think, Atleti and Sevilla are still very much in the conversation for the yes. La Liga title race. I think people will take Atleti more serious than, than Sevilla, obviously. We'll talk about the big three, but I just want to say one thing about Sevilla because I don't understand what is happening to Lopetegui Sevilla. They're fun to watch. They're, they're a good team. They're talented. They're balanced. They have the best away record in La Liga, but only the 13th best home record. It's something like they almost prefer to play their games away. outside of the Sanchez Pizjuan, where it's always historically it's been the exact opposite. A couple of years back, Sevilla went the entire season without a single away win. Now they're the best away team in La Liga, but bottom half of the table when they play at the Sanchez Pizjuan. That said, they're still in the top four. That would be a almost a dream finish for them, um, a team we've seen a lot in the Europa League, but have the talent to be a Champions League-style uh, team. So it, it, we're at the midpoint of the season, and it's really difficult to predict who's going to win the title, who's going to finish top four, who's going to take those three Europa League spots. Maybe a little bit more certain in terms of the relegation, but even then there's about like six teams that could end up in the bottom three. It really is all up in the air, and let's begin because just like you said, we are at the halfway point, 19 rounds in, 19 to go, and let's begin with Espanyol taking on Barcelona. It was the Catalan derby. But it didn't look it. Espanyol, bottom of the table, Barcelona top, and they draw 2-2. Barcelona dropping points away from home yet again. Yeah, Frankie de Jong was sent off for the first time in his career. Uh, second yellow card with about a quarter of an hour left to play. Uh, Wu Lei, um, basically you can hear the cheers from China uh, in the Catalan capital. First where, ever Chinese player to yeah. score against Barcelona, and, and, and ever. I, so I did his debut when he joined Espanyol at first, and it was immediate from the get-go that this was not a marketing ploy. Like This may have been conceived initially as a way of getting more Chinese viewers, right. but he, you could tell that he could play. And he offered a, a very different dynamic to Piatti, the player whose who spot he took after Piatti had a really serious knee injury. Because Piatti was a player who was always going to be a playmaker, sit a little bit deeper back and try and make things happen for other players. Ule was going to make constant runs to try and score himself, and he gets a massive goal for a player who's arguably the best Chinese player um, that we've seen. He looks like a, like a guy who deserves to play at this level in La Liga and scores a massive goal for Espanyol. But it's disappointing for Barcelona. It's not just that you know you lose the derby to, to your to your city rivals, your arch rivals, a team that you, you typically tend to dominate, but they're in, they're in last place. And they're in last place even after the draw. I right. said lose, draw the derby. But even after that, they're still in last place. They were the only team that was in single digits until just the other day. So. It's, it's been a season of missed opportunities. Real Madrid missed opportunities when, when Barcelona were slipping and Madrid got a bunch of draws. Atleti have been missing opportunities Sevilla. all season long because both Barcelona and Madrid look very beatable. Um, Sevilla missed opportunities because all they allowed the Atleti to, to pass yeah. them. Uh, so it, it's got to be a little frustrating, I think, for all of, the, all of the candidates and all of the top teams that no one's really been able to distance themselves uh, as a clear favorite or even as a clear, you know, outside of Barcelona and Real Madrid, finisher in the top four. Right, which makes La Liga really a wide-open race. Gabriel Paso is saying props to Espanyol, but Barcelona has no business dropping points against them. And props to Abelardo Fernandez to get yep. a crucial point in, during a time where he really has to redirect this ship. Right. And former Barca defender Abelardo, so a special match for him to be right. on, the, on the other side of that derby. Um, teams do get a bit of a perk sometimes with a, a new manager. They're, you know, minutes are up for grabs. Um, but, but there's no excuse for Barcelona. No. They, they start games flat. Some of the in-game decisions by, by Ernesto Valverde um, can, can be questioned. They're obviously not at their best. This is the worst first half for a Barcelona team 
in more than a decade. You have to go back to Frank Reichardt's last season, 07, 08, I think it was, right, right before Pep Guardiola joined the team. Uh, Barcelona, that was the last time the Barca had 40 points after Half 19 rounds. So at the same exact point, that ended up being Reichardt's last season. Guardiola takes over the following summer. Um, they haven't been this bad since that 07 uh, campaign. Uh, young Jay Swagger saying the Valverde effect on Barca. Uh, Bavon Gray earlier in the show, you saw the comment there saying Valverde out. What role does he play realistically in in this? I don't know epitome? who Valverde is, but Valverde out. Is oh, Valverde. Uh, Fede hashtag. Valverde. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you see this, this trend amongst Barcelona fans that they continue to be not happy with Ernesto Valverde. Yeah, and I think that's independent of them dropping points, right? Because Barcelona is still top of the table because yes. Madrid haven't been brilliant. They have to deal with their injuries. Atletico haven't taken advantage, as we mentioned earlier. So they're still top of the table. They're still in, in a very good position to win La Liga. And as long as you have Messi, you're in contention for everything, Champions League included. So they're, they're so talented, especially up top. Luis Suarez actually had a pretty decent match. He had the uh, assist. Yeah, uh, he, he had a, a brilliant goal and a brilliant assist to, to um, uh, Arturo Vidal. And the last 10... Uh, Barcelona goals, right. Luis Suarez in La Liga so, has somehow, some way been involved, so, either scoring or assisting. Yeah, so they have they have the talent to, right. to go out and win this thing. I think it's a tired debate, and I don't want to go over it again. I think it's the how that matters to Barcelona fans often. And it, that was even the case before the Messi era when Barcelona were as dominant as they are now, but especially now when they've won you know so many league titles in Messi in the Messi era that it's almost they almost take it for granted. And right. so it is about how Barcelona are playing. And it's, it's been a long time since, since I remember seeing Barcelona play really well away from home. They've only picked up half of the points away from home, uh, 15 out of 30 so far this season. Yeah, they dropped of the 15 Camino. points. Yeah, uh, Jaben Karama saying at home, Barca is strong and away they're weak. That's one of the reasons they won't win the Champions League. So Barca fans also concerned about the well, Champions League. So it depends there if you're getting the second leg at home or away, right? right? That, that's, that's a massive thing for me. When you get to the elite eight, the, the, la the, the last eight teams, which are all the, the top teams, the uh, the Liverpools, the Barca's, the Madrid's, they're all sort of, I don't think they're obligated to win the Champions League because there can only be one winner. I think they're obligated to be in that group of the last eight teams. And once you get there, it's massive who gets that second leg at home, as, as Barcelona saw against Roma, as Barcelona saw against Liverpool. Um, and just going away from the Champions League and just focusing on what is a very tight La Liga race right now, right. second half of the season, Barcelona have to go away to Valencia, to Mestalla. That's their next uh, La Liga away game after the uh, Super Cup. They have to go away to the Bernabeu for the second classical of the season. And you might not think that Betis and Villarreal are, you know, superlative, superlative teams at the moment, but they're top 10 in terms of their home record at the Benito Villamarín um, and at the uh, Estadio de la Ceramica. And Barca have to go to both of those venues as well. Plus, they still travel to Sevilla. Granted, Sevilla not great at home, but they can turn that around the second half. And of the to year. Madrid. The, the, they're going to have a more <laughs> difficult second half. Than, than Real Madrid and, and possibly Atletico as well. And that's going to be a challenge for Barca. Uh, Joel Garcia saying there's no balance to the team. They don't have that grit to compete. The tactics are slow and inconsistent. And I want to talk a little bit about grit because Barcelona fans love to see that man just behind uh, Andres Cordero, Arturo Vidal, come in. Uh, they think that he adds a little bit of that grit to midfield. And he's l linked with the rumor that he's headed out of the sure. Camp Nou, maybe to Inter Milan. Do you think Barcelona would be silly to let him go in this transfer window? Well, so what Vidal had said himself is that if he didn't feel important, that he would go. But it's hard to imagine how he doesn't feel important given Ernesto Valverde has just always found ways to put him in the team. Right. He's Barca's fourth top scorer. He was that before um, he scored the goal against Espanyol. Six um, goals with and, six and, shots on target. Yeah, so it's unbelievable. After Messi, Suarez, and Griezmann, Arturo Vidal is the only other guy scoring consistent goals. And he gives you a bit of that. Remember when Paulinho first signed the Barcelona? It was a little bit of a joke, and it morphed from a joke to a threat very quickly because right. he was that second wave of attack, you know, joining the attack from the midfield. That when there was a bounce or you know, the, the, the front three were occupying the defense, he, he just popped there. up to score relatively simple goals. Well, Arturo Vidal is doing that for Barcelona this season, in a season when Frankie de Jong is not doing that. Artur doesn't really do that, although he occasionally shoots from distance and he's been out for a while. So they, they haven't had that guy who can provide uh, a, a goal-scoring threat from the midfield. Arturo Vidal does that. And I assume with Artur still about five to six weeks from making his return, they were going to see Vidal starting a lot because Alenia walked away. Right. And I think that's actually quite damning because Alenia wasn't sent away. He walked away. Reportedly, it was Carles Alenia's uh, decision to go and, and take that loan move to Betis. It was a clause in his contract that allowed him to do that. And at a time when Valverde seemed to be giving him a few more minutes, he thought, I want to go start somewhere, so he'll challenge for a starting spot at Betis. Everyone in our comment section uh, hyping up Vidal, everyone uh, 
including Raul Rodriguez, who says Vidal is very crucial to the team and we can't let him go. He adds a threat and more physical presence, which we hear often. Uh, this is a reminder to all of you watching on the Be An Extra channel that if you join us uh, on Facebook, you can send in your comments and watch simultaneously. So, yeah. Let's move on. Uh, Real Madrid walk away with a 3-0 win over Getafe. Verón, as you saw in the beginning of the show, crucial to that match. But Courtois, a new fan favorite. <sighs> and, yes. I just said that sentence. So unbelievable uh, performance. The so Courtois had been playing well for Madrid well before that um, Valencia draw, um, right before the was it Mestalla? Yeah, it was Mestalla yeah. right before the Clasico. But I, I contended then, and I, I I still think now he needed a high-profile moment to change the narrative. Not to change his play, not to change reality, just to change the narrative around him that people weren't happy with Courtois, that there was no reason to let go of Keylor Navas. Right. All those things may still be true, but Courtois is coming up with some massive performances. They've had, what, 10 clean sheets now in, in 19 games, the first half of the season. They're tied with Atletico Madrid for the best defensive record in La Liga, and that's not exclusively down to Courtois, yeah. but Courtois made three massive saves against Getafe in that first half to keep it um, to keep it level. Right. And so... Uh, Madrid finally broke through. Um, so clearly, I, I think he's now, if he's not broken out of the um, Keylor Navas shadow, I think at the very least, that shadow no longer matters, at least until the next high-profile mistake by, by Thibaut Courtois. Right. But I think it's uh, Madrid's defense in general that that that's, should be lauded and, and is merit-worthy. Um, only 12 goals conceded the first half of the campaign. Again, mentioned the, the 10 clean sheets. Right. Whether it's Ede Militao getting an opportunity or... Um, Who was Ramos, superb. Ramos and Varane. Right. Um, Carvajal. They've been without Marcelo. Marcelo's not the best defensive presence, but uh, Benjamin Mendy is uh, fit in beautifully. Right. Um, and so I think it's what, what makes Madrid so competitive right now and the, the reason they've been able to deal with those absences in attack is they've been so solid defensively. Well, and especially during a season where they've had some trouble scoring goals. Yeah. That makes their defensive work all the more important. Right. Well, again, uh, they've got, I think, 13 goals fewer than Barcelona do. This, they're the second. It's weird when we talk about, well, they struggle to score goals. You're right. They do struggle to score As goals. As per their Exactly. Standards. For what the expectation Correct. is for Real Madrid because they're the second top scoring side in La Liga, but they're 13 goals back of Barcelona. The reason it's still very, very close even on goal difference is because they concede so few. So the difference in, in, in the, the tiebreaker at the moment is just the difference of two goals. Right. Uh, Bassam saying that Mendy's insertion into the starting lineup uh, is also a difference improved Real's defense. And he did, because just like you said, he does more defensive work than Marcelo does. I think I said Benjamin Mendy. I always make that mistake. It's Ferland Benjamin. Mendy. Ferland Mendy, right? No, yeah. Ferland Mendy, yeah. yes. Benjamin Mendy. Oh, my God. Was Benjamin ex, Mendy, uh, because he was in the news player. this morning. Yeah. Um, not this morning, but this weekend. You guys have to see the whole Tom Pope situation. Yeah. We don't have time for it here, but please go look at what Benjamin Mendy did. Um, Danny Franco saying, hey, guys, don't you think that's due to the club's decision? Tibor Courtois has been mistreated by some media. Interesting. I think that the, what happened to Courtois was directly related to Keylor Navas. Everyone at Real Madrid and Barcelona is mistreated by the media. That, that just comes, like, that comes with the, the, the job. Yeah, it's, you're, you're playing for two of the biggest clubs on the planet. Um, the media in Spain is hyper-partisan. They call it uh, periodismo de bufanda, right? Which is uh, journalism with a scarf on. Like, you've got your team scarf on. And it, it's, it's a weird sort of dynamic that, that the Spanish press take. But they are essentially fans with a microphone. Right. Um, so yeah, you're going to be mistreated. I, I don't. I think all those players expect that, and it's down to how you deal with it. It's why you might have a player who is a standout, you know, at, at a mid-table La Liga club or, or mid-table uh, anywhere in the top five European leagues. Comes to Barcelona, comes to Real Madrid, and it takes a full season to adapt because the, the difference is the mentality. I think it also has to do with this, the situation that Courtois came into, that he was replacing a Keylor Navas who was so beloved by fans that a lot of fans and maybe media members thought that they had to choose one or the other. Sure, and but that he wasn't, he wasn't, in, in supporting Navas, you instantly had to be anti-Courtois or something point. like it. And I know that Danny Franco, who... Um, is a friend of ours, agrees with that with right. that situation. So, yeah. That's fair. Um, Arturo Ruiz Hazard has been nothing but an upset. We haven't seen much of Hazard. He's been injured. And I mean, been, and it, when he was playing, he was great. He'd been playing well. Right. Um, it, it took him a while to get into game shape. Um, the, the first, I would say, five, six rounds of La Liga just looked slower and um, not as in sync. Um, but I thought, you know, f a few weeks before he got injured, he'd been playing at a really, really high level, um, creating chances. So I, it's been a disappointment just because he's sort of out of sight and out of mind, right. but not necessarily for his performances. The question when he comes back is he's still not likely to be a high-volume goal scorer for Real Madrid. He'll get his goals, but he's not going to be a guy who's going to put up 20 goals the rest of the season. So who is? Because he'll create some chances. He'll create chances for Benzema. He'll create chances for whether it's Rodrigo or whomever else is playing alongside him. But it still does feel like outside of Benzema, even with the return of Hazard, unless Gareth Bale is all of a sudden playing very regularly and banging in goals, 
I don't know who's going to be that consistent goal scorer for Madrid. Um, Jean Kiel saying, unfortunately for Courtois, he was the guy who took the job away from a fan favorite, so he's put he was put into that tough situation, and I totally agree. Uh, let's move on to Atleti, who won two one against Levante. You were on the call for this game, yep. exciting one. Oblak, the octopus. All of a sudden, uh, yeah. So we can talk about Oblak because he made some terrific saves. He only had two saves to make. But they were both very, very difficult, both from the same player. Uh, uh, Levante's Bardi tested him twice. They were both excellent saves. Um, and they were important because Atleti scored twice, so those two saves were the difference between one point or all three. Right. Um, but it's the other end that, that's, that's seen a change because Oblak has been one of the best goalkeepers on the planet for a long time. It's in attack now where there's a bit more dynamism to Atletico Madrid, a bit more threat. You still think Thanks that to an angel. And Angel Correa, who has He's to start. He's been amazing. Yeah. I, I get why Simeone wanted to bring Angel Correa off the bench. He is just like a Tasmanian devil. Like he, he's got so much energy that if you bring him into a game against some tired legs, he can make things happen. But right now, you can't keep him out of the no. starting eleven. He's he's been involved with more more goals than any other player for for Atletico in terms of goals and assists. He just scored his third uh, in this match. It was a really good goal as well. And they've now scored uh, two goals in what is it? Five consecutive games, I want to say. It was against yes. Lokomotiv Moscow, maybe four. Lokomotiv Moscow and three straight La Liga games. Yeah, and they're on they three they straight La Liga two. wins, right. which they needed to find this form because they were on a very rough start to the season. And, and doing that without the, the services of Tomas Lemar, who looks to be on his way out, he was blasted for the second time now by Diego Simeone, who doesn't really hold his tongue for anybody. Earlier in the season, uh, there was a radio interview that Simeone did where he said that Atleti would be good again when some of the players they've brought in to replace guys like Antoine Griezmann and whatnot started to perform at their level. And that was a not-so-subtle shot at Thomas Lamar. Right. He was much more explicit in the interview he gave prior to this game where he said Lamar just isn't living up to expectations. And part of what, what's holding Atleti back now with, with interest, we'll talk maybe about Cavani and whatnot, but they have a salary cap issue where the one guy they wanted to get rid of this summer was Angel Correa because they needed to sell him in order to bring in another striker, another goal scorer. They're really happy that they failed in trying to get rid of Angel Correa because he's been instrumental, especially down this positive stretch that ended 2019 and started 2020. And in a way, Angel Correa is doing what a lot of people expected Joao Felix to do when he hasn't been able to do, I it's, think. It's been nine, nine La Liga games now for Joao Felix without a goal or an assist. And I don't, I don't want to judge a kid who's 20 years old playing his first campaign in La Liga, making the jump from the Portuguese league to the Spanish top flight, which I believe to be the best league in the world. So I'm not going to be overly Retweet. critical or too harsh on, on Joao Felix. Right. Um, but he, he will be judged based on his price tag, not based on his age. Right. That's just sort of the sad reality of going to a, a big club, a contender, and for that, that kind of money. So you don't treat him as a 20-year-old. You treat him as a guy who's taking one of 11 jobs on the pitch for Atletico Madrid, and he has been disappointing. Uh, Richard Murray saying, I said it before, Atleti are trying to find their balance. Uh, balance has no exact time for any team when it will be found. And that is what Diego Simeone himself said at the beginning of the season, that this was kind of a transition year, so it does seem that they found uh, their form. Yeah, Simeone was trying to take a bit of pressure off, I think, when he said that. But gr granted, it's a fair point to make because they lost basically the backbone of the team with uh, Godin, Rodri, and Griezmann all Even moving on in the same yeah. summer. That's pretty brutal. Absolutely. Uh, Bavon Gray, don't judge the kid, Andres. He said he won't judge just, him, just on the price tag, not the <laughs> age. Um, Valencia also with a big win, a 1-0 win against Abar, and with Sevilla dropping points, like you said, they are tied um, in very third fun. and fourth. So, very exciting. La Liga race. This is why you can't miss a match, guys, because it's the best league in Europe and in the world. Okay, uh, let's move on. Zlatan has officially played in four consecutive decades. He uh, came in for his first match for AC Milan this morning. Unfortunately, it ended uh, nil all against Sampdoria, so he hasn't done what... Uh, he came off People the thought he was going to do, but yeah, he came he off, did the bench. Come off the he, bench. He replaced uh, Piantek, which, you know, Piantek had a, a, a brilliant start to his Milan career and a not so brilliant um, encore this season. He's been disappointing, and so they did need to go out and look for a goal scorer. I personally love the move. I, I think um, Slatan, even at 38 years old, being back in the big time is, is a big deal, but specifically in Serie A. And, and we've talked about this before. We saw. Luca Toni at uh, what, 35 years old, 37 years old. He won the Capo Canonieri title, scoring 22 goals. That was the season that he shared that uh, scoring title with um, Maru Icardi. We saw Fabio Quagliarella yeah. last season at 35 years old, win the Capo Canonieri top scorer. Right. One of the best examples is Toto Di Natale, the ex uh, Udinese player who averaged 22 goals per season from the age of 32 to 37. 
Uh, Francesco Totti played to the age of 40. So this and, is the right place for this was, man. He was still a regular starter at 38, which is what, what um, Slatan is now. And Slatan had almost as many goals as games played in Major League Soccer for the LA Galaxy. Granted, the, the level of defending, the, the, the tactical um, challenges are much greater in Serie A than they right. are in, in MLS. But I still think he's a guy who can come in and contribute double-digit goals for a team that, as we saw from their scoreless draw against Sampdoria, desperately needs goals. Greg Garcia also thinks so. He says, Zlatan is going to get Milan to the top four. Oh, I don't know that is that. bold, very, and we're going to move on. Very, oh, on that very, note. Very ambitious. Um, like, top four of what? <laughs> yeah, mm, explain yourself, Greg. We like your ambition, though. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo showed up to the Allianz Stadium. Uh, I, I would want to say in fashion because that's up for everyone to decide, but like this. Tragic. And uh, let me step out of the way here that's because <laughs> yeah. um, this is, yes, guys, this is an iPod shuffle. Shuffle. Game. A little bit of a history note for everyone on National Technology <laughs> Day. This uh, was invented in 2005, Andres, and oh. it was discontinued in 2017. So why it is here on a footballer <laughs> who makes a ton of money is beyond me. You know, you can talk about it, but I, he's supposed to be a style icon, and I'm looking at the ponytail. Okay, the yeah, let's dissect this. So, what part of this is the worst for you, Andres? And you guys let us know what you think, too, because this is really your it's, show. It's the part we can't see. Uh, it's the part that's cropped out. Let's there. get a next, another photo so we can see the really the if, worst part. If I'm, if I'm an opposition player, by the way, I'm showing up to the next game with a Walkman on. Yeah. Just to, just to one up him, yeah. and then the cassette player is going to yeah. be next. No, that's this the Walkman. Ridiculous. The Walkman was yeah, cassette. The Walkman. Yeah. The, oh, the well, what's phone? the CD one? Uh, CD player. Di that was, a, CD disc, player? It was a Discman. It was a Discman. Yeah. Discman. Yeah. Discman. Yeah. Oh my, this is before my time. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, the hair is atrocious. Uh, I don't know. He's trying to be Gareth Bale, but oh, it's going to take on. a while because that's like a little pony. I don't get it. A little pony. <laughs> It, remember, it, it reminds me of uh, when David Beckham had the uh, double ponytail thing in his days with Real Madrid. And what did you think swag. of that? That was new. That was swag. Yeah. No one has had that before. This right. has been done. Um, Mo Uchicha saying, guess they don't have AirPods in Italy. That was my observation, too. So not only is he with the iPod shuffle, but then he doesn't even have the AirPods in. He's right. doing it just to attract attention. He's a man of people. <laughs> yeah, it's, the it's room a, is literally silent over this, of, so we're going to uh, move on. Uh, but, but vintage is in now. But Von Gray said CD player. It's just yeah, called a CD, CD player, player right, then, right, I guess. The Walkman guys, which was Sony, had one specifically called Discman. Yeah. Discman. Um, Phil Labrie which, saying... Which, by the way, you would clip on to your belt. Yeah, exactly. Which you had like and this, when you walk, this when you walk, it would <laughs> Yeah, it would skip. So oh, no. <laughs> Massive design flaw. Yeah. Um, Ryan Moran, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with his image. Sharp and retro. Yeah, see? Sure. Oh, so Ryan Moran actually likes it. He's already retro. Yeah, Phil Lavrier saying if it still works, why not? That's that's very true. You know, there's no reason to move on from tomorrow. Okay, let's hop on the transfer train uh, for a couple minutes here because we are running out of time. Uh, okay. The big one on the in, in the transfer news, I mean globally, really, is this Rainier Zizouz from yeah. Flamengo. Uh, Real Madrid apparently already have the deal all lined up. They're just waiting for him to turn 18 years old. Yeah. This, Another young Brazilian. Right. It's a, it's a it's a recurring theme now for Real Madrid to go out and get a, a Vinicius, get a Rodrigo, get a Rainier. Right. Rainier is a, is a player, for, I've not seen him play yet, and I did a ton of Flamengo in the um, Copa Libertadores this season, um, but from what, I, from what I gather from Brazilian journalists, he is highly, highly touted as the next big uh, guy out of the Flamengo youth system. But until we see him play, we don't know, and, and how, many Brazilian, how many young Brazilian attacking players can you sign? We've seen Madrid have some success Lately, with you know signing players and sending them away on loan, we see the the success that Martin Odegaard is having right, right now for La Real. So it's not out of the question that they just send. Obviously, Vinicius and Rodrigo are now playing a, a role, so right. they're not going to go on loan. But someone like uh, Ranieri can. Um, and Felipe Luis himself said that Ranieri is even better than Kaká. So Which, that's high praise yeah, from we'll the man. <laughs> and this is not fully buying it. Uh, speaking of Flamengo, this one's really interesting. Gabby Gold to Chelsea. Uh, so Inter Milan have to sell Gabby Gold this uh, winter window because they want to get the money and invest it elsewhere. Uh, Gabby Gold linked with a couple Premier League clubs, but Chelsea the latest. It would be really interesting to see him under Frank Lampard. Yeah, Chelsea, would, the, the last I had heard was West Ham before Chelsea. Right, right which, correct. Uh, you know, that was last week. Maybe, maybe not, you know, less than ideal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But, it's uh, a moving train, Andres. Yeah. We move on quickly. Can't stop it, baby. Chelsea, uh, Chelsea are young and exciting, and, and it would be a, a good fit because from what we saw from him this season, he was top scorer in the Brasileirao, top scorer in the Libertadores. He looked like the player who went to Inter with all of that promise. Obviously flopped at Inter, and Inter now have uh, Lautaro and Lukaku, so not really a spot for uh, Gabi Gol. 
clearly he has to go somewhere else. That would, I think Chelsea would be an excellent uh, choice. And to wrap up our uh, transfer tracker, Jesse Lingard has fired his agent, and he's going to now be working with Mino Raiola, which means he's for sure going to be on the move. He's going to get I paid. I think so. Is, is yeah, and get paid yeah. big. Where could you see him? Oh, I don't know. Because asking? he's been so underwhelming. All I mean, he hasn't had a goal or assist all year right. for Manchester United. Not this year, right. last year. So it's his agent's fault. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That'll be insane. I did meet Jesse Lingard, nice guy, and I'd like to see him, uh, you know, at a nice place. Anyway, a uh, reminder to tune into Magisterial tonight and Weekend Winners, followed by Monday Night Soccer. It's going to be a fabulous show. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Sports Burst was presented by Bosch Icon High Performance Windshield Wipers.